Okay, so here we go. Welcome back to Computer Science Physics 219A. I usually say it the other way around, but it is, after all, both a computer science and a physics class. It's hard to believe we're closing in on the end of the term. It's just rocketed by. Um, this will be the second to last lecture. In the original syllabus, I said there would be 20 lectures. Then I realized we were running a little ahead of schedule. Um, and uh, in the end, there will be 18. I am cutting one of the topics, which was in the original syllabus, the lecture on the general solution to the abelian hidden subgroup problem. Um, there are notes about that in the revised chapter six notes, if you're interested, but I wanted to move ahead more quickly to discuss Grover's algorithm as we did in the previous lecture. So you'd be prepared for homework problems relating to that. And in this lecture and, and, the, and the next one, we'll cover the, our last two topics. Today, using quantum computers to simulate quantum systems. Uh, and in the next lecture, the QMA completeness of the problem of estimating the energy of a quantum system. So uh, let's get going. So Feynman actually already foresaw 40 years ago when he first proposed the idea that a quantum computer would be able to vastly outperform classical computers for some task. He had in mind the task of simulating how quantum systems behave. That's a problem which is certainly of great interest to physicists in many areas of physics and also to chemists. And it does have applications as well um, to, uh, well, everything having to do with materials and chemistry, including human health, pharmaceuticals, agriculture, um, energy production, improving the sustainability of our planet, and all those things, which are certainly important. And where we do expect quantum computers will eventually make a contribution. And in this example, I want to talk about two ways in which we can use quantum computers to solve quantum problems. In both cases, we'll consider a quantum system with a so-called local Hamiltonian, and I'll explain what that means in the lecture, but I guess I'll tell you now. That just means the Hamiltonian can be written as a sum of terms, and that each of the term acts non-trivial, each of those terms acts non-trivially on just some constant number of qubits independent of the system size. And we care about local Hamiltonians, especially not just because quantum computers can deal with them well, but because we think that the phenomena we observe in nature can be described as resulting from the dynamics of such a local Hamiltonian. And for such systems, for local Hamiltonians, um, we'll see that with the quantum computer, time evolution of the system with a specified volume for a specified time with an error, which is polynomially small as the volume gets large, that can be simulated with a quantum circuit of polynomial size, polynomial in the spatial volume and in the evolution time. And the second task we'll consider, which turns out to be related, is estimating the energy eigenvalues of a local Hamiltonian, measuring the energy of a quantum system to an accuracy, which goes like one over, a uh, polynomial in the volume of the system under consideration, that too can be achieved using a quantum circuit which has polynomial size, now polynomial in the volume of the system, assuming we're able to prepare somehow a quantum state in our quantum computer, which has a non-negligible overlap going like one over polynomial of the volume, with the energy eigenstate in question. 
that's an important caveat as we'll see in the next lecture. So let's start with considering evolution. Well, first, let me just say again what I mean by a local Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian can be written as a sum of terms. Each one of the terms acts on a number of qubits at most k, and k is a constant, doesn't depend on the size of the system. And each one of the terms in the Hamiltonian has a bounded supnorm. All the terms are bounded in norm by some constant, which I'm calling little h. What do we want to do with this local Hamiltonian? We want to solve for the dynamics that it generates. There's a time-dependent Schrodinger equation, which describes how state vectors evolve, governed by this Hamiltonian, that the state at time t is related to the state at some initial time zero by a time evolution unitary operator, u of t. And u of t satisfies this first order differential equation, the Schrodinger equation. The time derivative of u with respect to t is given by minus i h of t, where h is the Hamiltonian at time t acting on u of t. And to solve this first order differential equation, we need a boundary condition, which is that at time zero, the unitary is zero. So the evolution begins at uh, time zero and it's determined for uh, subsequent times. The evolution is determined by this Schrodinger equation. Often in physics, uh, we consider Hamiltonians which are time independent but we're going to allow the Hamiltonian to depend on time. There will be some kind of technical condition that the Hamiltonian not vary with time too rapidly, but we do want to allow, to allow it to uh, depend on time for the purpose of our discussion. So there is some ideal quantum state. There's some specified initial state, and in, in practice, I'm going to want that to be something I can load into a quantum computer efficiently. And some ideal state determined by the Schrodinger equation at the later time t. And what we want to do is create a state in our quantum computer, which is close to that ideal state. Our criterion for close will be that the norm of the difference between the actual state that we construct with a quantum circuit, psi tilde, and the ideal state is less than delta. Well, here I said delta equals a constant, but actually I, I'll sometimes um, consider delta getting small with system size. But anyway, there's some error delta, which we can take to be the deviation in the norm. You know, I, I could have talked about, uh, since states are really rays, I could have talked about distance between density operators, but uh, it'll be fine to consider state vectors for our purposes. We want to approximate the actual state determined by the evolution, determined by h of t uh, at some later time. Now, normally when we want to compare what a quantum computer does to a classical computer, of course, we want to compare with the classical task. I didn't describe this as a classical task. I said the task was to prepare a um, quantum state. And I don't necessarily want to claim that that quantum state has a succinct classical description. And at any rate, that's not what the quantum algorithm does. It doesn't give me a succinct classical or any classical description of the state. It just gives me the state. So if I want to compare to something that a quantum uh, computer can uh, you know, compete with a classical computer, if I want to consider a task that a classical computer can perform and then ask whether the quantum computer can speed that up, uh, then we can imagine we make a measurement at the end that there's some observable that we're interested in. Uh, at time t, we measured the observable. And by doing so, we are sampling from the probability distribution of outcomes for uh, that measure observable in the final state psi of t. That's what we want the computation to do. And for Classical computers, we think it's a hard task in the sense that we don't know how to do it without using resources. 
that are exponential in the size of the quantum system. Of course, as we've discussed before, the, uh, the state is just a vector in a Hilbert space. The unitary operator is just a, um, a big matrix. But for n qubits, it's a huge matrix. It's of exponential size. It's 2 to the n by 2 to the n. And to actually classically represent u of t is um, hard to do. Of course, I don't necessarily have to classically represent u of t in order to solve the problem of sampling from this distribution, but we just don't know a way of doing it, any way of doing it uh, that doesn't require exponential resources. And it's not for lack of trying. Physicists and chemists have been trying to come up with better classical algorithms for simulating the evolution of quantum systems for many decades, but still, after all that effort, the best algorithms that we have have a runtime which is exponential in the number of qubits on a classical computer. And we want to see whether with a quantum computer we can do better. Now, for a general k local Hamiltonian, the way I've defined it, there isn't any geometric constraint on how the qubits couple to one another. So I could have a term in the Hamiltonian uh, which acts non-trivially collectively on any set of k qubits. And I can collect together in the Hamiltonian all of the uh, terms that uh, act on a given set of uh, k qubits. And then the number of such terms that I would need um, would just be at worst n choose k. That would be the number if every set of k qubits had some term in the Hamiltonian acting on it. Uh, but what we're often interested in instead are geometrically local Hamiltonians. And what that means is that only neighboring qubits are coupled to one another when the qubits are arranged in a lattice in some number of spatial dimensions, let's say in D dimensions. And um, so what we mean by ge geometrically local is we imagine the qubits arranged in a D-dimensional lattice for some finite D. And all of the terms in the Hamiltonian that act collectively and non-trivially on some set of up to k qubits uh, act inside a constant size volume independent of the system size. So in other words, there aren't any very long range interactions among the qubits. The size of the ball that contains uh, any interaction term is the range of the interaction. Geometrically local means that's a constant. And then the number of terms in the Hamiltonian that we need really just scales with the volume of the system. No matter what the number of dimensions is, if we consider this ball of constant size, you know, relative to the spacing between points on the lattice, that's um, going to contain some constant number of qubits. But furthermore, each qubit will only be contained in some constant number of balls. So that such terms will just scale with the total number of qubits. And the geometrically local case is what um, we think fundamentally uh, is the right way to describe nature. So that case is of special interest. And as far as we know, the number of spatial dimensions is three uh, in the world, although there's some controversy about that. But at any rate, uh, it's, although, well, whether physics is really geometrically local once we start worrying about the effects of gravitation is a subtle question and maybe the answer is no. Uh, but uh, for uh, the purposes of the physics we understand best, like the particle physics that we've studied in high energy physics experiments, local Hamiltonians seem to be a quite adequate description. So that's mostly what I wanna consider here. And so we wanna evolve for some time t but uh, we're gonna do that with quantum gates with some circuit of operations acting on the qubit. So I'm going to approximate the continuous Schrodinger time evolution by a sequence of discrete steps. That's the way we always simulate time evolution on a, um, 
on a computer because we can only, um, well, the analog devices, I guess, are different. But uh, with digital computers, we always approximate time evolution as a, a finite number of discrete steps. And likewise, if we're interested in continuous systems spatially, to put it on a computer, we always consider, as I described a minute ago, some kind of lattice which approximates the uh, that continuum system. Um, so we're going to consider processes typically that you know take place on on some distant scale of physical interest. So we'll want the lattice spacing for our model system to be small compared to that physical scale of interest so that uh, although it's really fundamentally discrete, the quantum system can capture approximately to a good approximation, the behavior of a continuous system. Okay, so we're going to divide the time evolution into little time steps of width delta. So the total number of such steps, if we're going to evolve for time t, will be t over delta. And now the big problem that we have is that the Hamiltonian conveniently is written as this sum of terms which have bounded support, which act on a constant number of qubits, but those terms don't commute with one another. So that makes solving the Schrodinger equation challenging. What we're going to do is something very simple, and then this can be systematically improved to get even better approximations. We're going to consider a time step that's sufficiently small that if I want to evolve for time delta, well, first of all, I can ignore the time dependence of the Hamiltonian during that time interval. We can take it as effectively constant. For a constant Hamiltonian, the solution to the Schrodinger equation formally is just the evolution operator is e to the minus i h times the time interval, in this case, delta. So um, ignoring the time dependence of the Hamiltonian over that time interval, we're, um, we just, we're just interested in constructing this operator. And uh, that is the exponential of a sum of non-commuting terms, kind of hard to deal with. But we're going to just, if they were commuting, we could just write that exponential of a sum as a product of exponentials. Now we can't justify that exactly when the terms fail to commute with one another, but we can uh, accept that as a first approximation to the operator we're really interested in. And that's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to approximate the exponential of the sum by a product of exponentials, and that's going to introduce some error which we're going to have to introduce, or which we're going to have to analyze. We're going to have to estimate that error. So let's do it. So what I would like to know is I have a um, exponential of a sum of operators. And now just to simplify the notation, I'm calling the operators that I'm summing over A sub A, where A is an index that uh, keeps track of the operators in the sum. I wanna know how well is that approximated by the product of the exponentials, okay? And all I'm going to do is I'm going to treat A as a small quantity. What I have in mind is that it has a small operator norm, and I'm going to try to estimate actually the operator norm of the difference between these expressions the exponential of the sum and the product of the exponentials. And I'm going to do so uh, making use of the power series expansion of the exponential. And I'm going to do the sum up to a certain order. I'm going to ignore the higher order terms. And uh, I'm not going to go into the detail here, but you can estimate those higher order terms in the uh, power series expansion of the exponential to make sure that we, uh, that we have a good approximation when we neglect the higher order terms. So let's just do it. So we have the exponential of the sum here and um, we expand it out. 
So the power series exp uh, expansion of an exponential, one plus the exp plus the sum, and then plus one half the product of two such sums. So I can write that as now I'm summing over two indices A and B, and um, one of the um, operators in the exponential is on the left, and I label that with the index A, and the other one is on the right, I label that with the index B. For A not equal to B, these guys may not commute, but I'm summing A and B over the full index set. So that's just the same thing as uh, the square of the sum over A of A sub A. And now I wanna subtract away this product. And for each exponential, the exponential of A sub A, I expand that in a power series, same way. Uh, so one plus a linear term A sub A, quadratic term one half A sub A squared. And if we wanted to, we could keep track of higher order terms too to estimate the error that we're making. Okay, so now, um, I want to expand this product over A. So this is just the same expression I had before for the exponential of the sum here. And now I want to expand the product of these power series um, up to quadratic order in A, okay? And there are two ways in which I can get terms which are of quadratic order. Well, First of all, the only way to get one is if I take one from every one of the products indexed by A. And then the only way I can get linear terms is if I take one everywhere except for an A in one of the factors of the product, and then all of the uh, po possible factors in the product contribute. So that's just one plus the sum over the index A sub A. Um, but now there are two ways to get quadratic terms. One is that I take the quadratic term from uh, one of the factors in the product and one everywhere else, and that gives the sum over a one half a a squared. And the second way is that I take the linear term in one of the factors and the linear term in another factor and then one everywhere else. And in that case, I can write it as the sum over um, a less than b of um, a sub a, uh, a sub b. Hold, hold on a second. Okay, sorry about that, I'm back. Um, so the reason it's a less than b is that the factors in the product are in a ascending order. So uh, the first, um, factor is um, a sub one, the second one is a sub two, the third one is a sub three and so on. So the a with the lower index is always to the left of the a with the higher index. So only the ordering a sub a, a sub b where the index a is less than b occurs when we expand this product. All right, so now, um, First of all, we notice the ones cancel in the difference, and so do the linear terms. Those are the same in both expressions. The quadratic terms are gonna be the first non-trivial terms. Of course, uh, they wouldn't be there at all if everything commuted. So the quadratic term is going to have to arise from uh, the failure of the different A's to commute with one another. So let's write this sum over all A and B of AA times AB as two separate sums. There's the terms with A less than B, um, AAAB, and the terms with A less than B, ABAA. So that keeps track of the two possible orders. Um, and it's the same thing as summing over A not equal to B. We're not including the A equals B case, because that got canceled between uh, this sum where we have one half a squared and this sum from expanding the product. So it's only the terms with a not equal to b that um, survive when we take the difference. And then here I've just subtracted um, away 
uh, this term in the uh, expansion of the product, um, there it is, uh, minus sum over a less than b of a, 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 b. Okay, so you see for the terms with a less than b, a, 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 b, I have a one half here and minus here. So that becomes minus one half the terms with a less than b of a, 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 b. Um, but then I also have one half the terms with a less than b, a, b, a, a. So altogether, that's going to give me minus one half the sum for a less than b, uh, a, 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 b minus a, b, a, a. In other words, the commutator of a, a with a, b. Um, so of course, that would be zero if the terms were all commuting. And then there are, the higher orders are cubic order in a and so on. So now remember the case we were interested in is when the terms are the terms in the Hamiltonian um, and uh, the time evolution operator is e to the minus i h delta. So the um, exponential of the Hamiltonian times minus i delta is going to have the sum over a h sub a and then here I have the product of e to the minus i h a delta. And so because I have uh, the i's and that gets squared, that cancels the minus one half here. And there's a factor of delta squared in the quadratic term. And then I have the sum over all a less than b of the commutator of h a with h b and then the higher order terms, which are of order delta cubed h cubed. So, if I'm interested in the, uh, the norm, let's say the soup norm of the difference between the actual time evolution operator governed by this Hamiltonian for time delta and our approximation, which is a product of these single terms in the Hamiltonian, e to the minus i h i delta, what's it going to be? Well, there can be a contribution from any pair of terms in the Hamiltonian that fail to commute with one another. Let's suppose we're talking about the geometrically local case. Um, well then, what does it mean for two terms to not commute with one another? Then they have to have qubits in common among the sets of qubits on which they act. Okay, in the geometrically local case, then for each term in the Hamiltonian, there's just some constant number of other terms that fail to commute with it. Those are the ones that are nearby contained inside some constant sized ball. So the number of commutator terms that are non-vanishing in which each term in the Hamiltonian per, uh, participates is um, a constant number. And so, I can take um, the delta squared out. And then remember, we're taking the norm, the soup norm of each term in the Hamiltonian to be bounded by h. So that means that we can bound the commutator by something of order little h squared. And then m here is just the number of terms in the Hamiltonian. Each term in the Hamiltonian has only a constant number of other terms it fails to commute with. So the number of non-vanishing commutators is proportional to the total number of terms in the Hamiltonian in the geometrically local case. It can scale differently with the number of terms in the Hamiltonian when we allow long range geometrically non-local interactions and we could do that too. But to keep the discussion simple, let's just consider the geometrically local case here. Okay, so now we want to carry out um, T over delta such steps. Here I've described our approximation to the evolution for time delta. We really want to evolve for time uh, T. So there will be T over delta steps. Using our approximation, the error that we make in each step, we can bound by the number of terms in the Hamiltonian M, a delta squared, our time step size, h squared, are bound on the Hamiltonian of each term. So the total error 
uh, which I'm calling delta, uh, goes like this. And so I can use that to estimate how small I need the time step capital delta to be in order for the total error for time t to be less than little delta. So I do that just by um, dividing here by m t h squared. And the conclusion is that we want the time step capital delta to be of order the total error little delta divided by h squared m t. Now, each one of the steps that we carry out involving a local term in the Hamiltonian, each one of these e to the minus h a deltas that we can um, achieve with um, a quantum computation that just acts on some constant number of qubits. And we have some universal gate set. And so we're going to approximate that by some uh, solovey kataev uh, polylog factor. But let's ignore that for now and just count the number of these local steps that we have to put together to simulate the evolution of the full system for time t. That is the number of operations of the form e to the minus i h a delta. And so how many is that? Well, the, um, it's the number of terms in the Hamiltonian, which I called capital M, times the number of steps, which is t over delta. So the circuit size that we need is going to be capital M t over delta times a constant. Now let's put back in what one over delta is. It's eight squared mt over little delta. One over capital delta, where delta is the time step, is going to be order eight squared mt over uh, little delta, the total error. So I can write this as eight squared mt squared over little delta. That's the number of gates I'm going to need where I think of a gate as one of these operations of the form e to the minus i h a delta, which is acting on no more than k qubits. Okay. And in the geometrically local case, as we already noted, the total number of terms in the Hamiltonian scales with the number of qubits because each qubit participates in only some constant number of terms because of the geometric locality. So up to a constant, I can also write this as the so-called circuit size, meaning the number of these elementary steps um, that we need to simulate the evolution with a total error, error little delta is eight squared, number of qubits n times time evolution time t, and t the quantity squared divided by little delta, the total error. So, little n times t, you can think of that as the volume of space time that we're simulating because the volume by which you can think of as the number of lattice sites that we're including in our simulation um, is going to scale with the number of qubits. So the, the physical volume is going to be um, the number of qubits times the volume per lattice site, but, but that's just some constant. So the uh, nt squared is essentially the spatial volume that we're simulating, no matter what the uh, number of spatial dimensions, times the time. So I'm calling that the simulated space-time volume. And um, so if we, if we fix the error delta, um, then um, that means, since h is also some constant, as we increase the space-time volume, the circuit size grows like the space-time volume squared. Now, if you really want to use some universal gate set, like some set of two qubit gates or something to uh, build our circuit, then we're going to have to um, approximate each one of the um, e to the mi minus i h a delta factors to um, an error which is approximately the same as the error we made by neglecting the higher order terms. And um, 
So what that means is we'll get a Solovey Kataya factor from that approximation. Um, but that's just going to be a poly log and, and one over that error. And that error per gate was about delta, uh, capital delta squared h squared. So it's a poly log factor of one over capital delta squared h squared from the uh, Solovey Kataya factor. Or if I again uh, rewrite that by substituting in the way capital delta scales our time step. Uh, then it's a polylog factor of an argument, which is similar to, uh, to, to this quantity, although it's got the h squared and the uh, space time volume squared, but it's divided by delta squared instead of delta. But at any rate, uh, up to a log factor, the circuit size that we need scales like uh, the space time volume squared. And so this is the nice result that we wanted. It's, uh, it's, it shows that we, uh, we don't know how to do it classically. But quantumly, we can simulate the time evolution, even when we have many, many qubits at a cost which uh, just scales polynomially in the number of qubits and uh, in the evolution time. In fact, we can systematically improve this. Uh, we could do that in the following way. These are called Suzuki Trotter higher order approximations. Uh, we canceled the uh, linear terms by approximating the exponential of a sum by a product of exponentials, but there are some quadratic terms that survive when uh, the terms are non-commuting. But we can put together a more clever sequence of these elementary operations of the form e to the minus i h a delta such that we get further cancellations. In fact, if we wanted to cancel the quadratic terms, it's a fun exercise to show that we can uh, simulate e to the minus i h a delta um, with a product in ascending order in time and then follow that with a product in descending order in time. And that causes all the quadratic terms to cancel. And so the remaining uh, error is going to be of order delta squared h cubed in that case. And you can even go further than that and get higher order cancellations, get the cubic terms to cancel and so on. And every time you do that, you pay a price in circuit size. Uh, if you want to cancel to higher and higher orders, uh, each time you increase the order of the cancellation that blows up the circuit by some constant factor. But um, Anyway, that allows you to reduce the factor of space-time volume to almost linear or as close as you want to go to a linear in the space-time volume. And, and there are other even more clever approximations that have a scaling which is actually linear um, in the space-time volume. So that's pretty nice. We can, with a quantum computer, simulate the evolution of some chunk of space-time at a cost which is essentially the uh, volume of space-time that we're simulating. So why, why is this significant? Well, it's an indication that our quantum circuit model really is powerful enough to describe the, describe the way nature really behaves. Because we think the way nature really behaves is that it evolves according to some Schrodinger equation. If we have some initial quantum state and we let it rip, there's some Hamiltonian that describes um, its dynamics. And uh, nature knows how to make the system evolve according to that Schrodinger equation. Our, if our computational model is sufficiently powerful that it can simulate anything that nature does, it should have the ability to simulate that evolution. And we've seen that indeed we can efficiently, uh, polynomially in the volume, and in fact, uh, linearly, if we're clever, um, simulate the, um, the evolution with our quantum computer. Now, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. Uh, what I just said goes beyond what we really know about nature vis-a-vis -vis our computational model for several reasons. 
Well, first of all, there was the issue of approximating a continuum by lattice, which I already made reference to. What physicists use to describe nature at a fundamental level is, is what we call quantum field theory. And in quantum field theory, there are really an infinite number of degrees of freedom per unit volume. So if I wanted to describe what's going on in the quantum field theory exactly, in principle, I would need an infinite number of qubits in some fixed spatial volume. And of course, we'll never be able to do that with finite resources. If I wanted to capture the way the quantum field theory behaves exactly, I'd need an infinite number of qubits per spatial volume. We're not going to do that. We're going to introduce this lattice spacing. Introducing the lattice spacing uh, causes an error. Uh, but like I said, we think as once the lattice spacing is small compared to the scale of some physical process that we're interested in, we can, uh, we can make that error small. Uh, there are further issues. Quantum field theory is described by a local Hamiltonian, but the terms at each lattice site actually don't have bounded norm as we assume that was important for getting our approximation that we could bound the norm by h um, and that's just not true in quantum field theory the degrees of freedom are like harmonic oscillators which um, and the operators acting on them have uh, have unbounded norm but we think it's a good approximation to truncate that infinite dimensional hilbert space at each lattice site by a finite dimensional one and introduce only a small error. And what makes that work is that we're interested in studying processes at some sufficiently low energy. As the energy increases, then we need to keep track of more and more per unit volume, because then we're considering processes in which we have shorter and shorter wavelength, and we need to capture the very short distance physics better and better to describe that. And we might also have fields which are highly excited at uh, each lattice site in that case. But the expectation is that at low enough energy, our quantum computer would be able to make a good approximation to the evolution. Now, the things that I've just said, I don't know how to make precisely rigorous. The rigorous discussion is, as I presented, we consider a lattice system with qubits on all the lattice sites, or they could be higher dimensional systems, but finite dimensional systems uh, at each lattice site, and, um, and a local Hamiltonian, not necessarily geometrically local, although that's usually what we're interested in. And each term in the expansion of the local Hamiltonian has bounded norm. And in that case, as I've argued and tried to convince you, we can use a quantum computer to get a good approximation to the evolution at a reasonable resource cost. Whether that's good enough to really describe nature is not a fully closed issue. Quantum field theory, uh, in particularly in three spatial dimensions, which is what we're really interested in, is a difficult subject to make mathematically rigorous. In lower dimensions, there's been more progress there. And then the even bigger issue which really is a serious issue, is um, what about gravity? Because when we take gravity into account, uh, there is evidence, physicists have uncovered, that we can't necessarily describe the dynamics as geometrically local. Uh, still, there are some reasons to believe that we can approximate the dynamics accurately using uh, some of the same tools as in uh, quantum field theory. But it's really an open question whether our quantum circuit model is powerful enough to, in general, approximate accurately the evolution in a system in which quantum gravity effects are important. Well, the question is either, um, well, the answer is either yes or no. Yes, the quantum circuit model is powerful enough and that would be a very pleasing answer because it means we'd be able to use quantum computers eventually to deepen our understanding of quantum gravity, which I actually think will happen. Uh, it may be 
a while, but I suspect that we'll be able to answer questions about quantum gravity and quantum field theory using quantum computers that would just be too hard to answer if we were limited to classical computers. But there's another tempting possibility that maybe the quantum circuit model is not powerful enough to describe evolution in quantum gravity. And that would be very exciting because it would suggest that the quantum circuit model hasn't yet fully captured the full computational power of nature. It may be that in that case, quantum gravity effects would uh, allow us to do even more powerful computation, which would um, go beyond what we can do with quantum circuits. My own prejudice is that that's not likely, that the quantum circuit model, as we've been studying it in this course, is adequate for describing nature adequately with uh, reasonable resources, but we just don't know at this point. All right, so now I wanna to turn to the other task I mentioned, which is estimating the eigenvalues of a big matrix in particular, the physics perspective on this would be, uh, there's some local Hamiltonian and we would like to measure the energy, okay? If we had some input state uh, in our quantum computer that we prepared somehow, uh, Never mind how for now, we'll come back to that. Um, we would like to perform a projective measurement of the energy. In doing so, we'll find the value of the energy and we will prepare in the quantum computer the corresponding energy eigenstate. And then once we have that energy eigenstate, we would be able to um, compute, uh, we could be able to simulate measurements. So efficiently computable observables and learn about the properties of that energy eigenstate. Classically, this is a hard problem, we think, because again, we're talking about really big matrices, matrices of exponential size. So what I wanna argue is that we can do such, uh, such measurements of the energy, such estimates of energy eigenvalues um, with resources on a quantum computer that are polynomial in N, polynomial in the number of qubits, polynomial in the system size. And I've already more or less told you how to do it. It's, the idea is to use phase estimation, as mentioned uh, in one of the previous lectures. Uh, we use a circuit like the one I've uh, crudely drawn here. I apologize for my hand drawing. Um, we are going to simulate time evolution um, up to time, which is a here, I put it over here. Um, there's some uh, fixed time, which I'm now calling capital T, and we're going to simulate for uh, the evolution according to our time independent Hamiltonian now, some fixed H for which I want to measure the eigenvalues. We're going to simulate the evolution e to the minus i ht for uh, various times. Oh, I think I made a mistake here. I wanted to say one, two, four. These are supposed to be uh, powers of two. For multiples of capital T, one, two, four, um, and uh, let me get that before I forget. Uh, eight up to uh, two to the M minus one for um, some integer M. And what we're gonna do is prepare a superposition of all those possible values of T. So it's um, a sum over all M bit strings like we've talked about before in this register that records the time. And then we're going to do evolution um, evolving by uh, e to the minus i h capital T, but then raised to the power little t. So there's some unitary, which is e to the minus i h capital T. And we can consider the teeth power of that. And that's evolving, that's this guy, e to the minus i 
uh, HT. And so we evolve for a time which is conditioned on the value of T in this, uh, whoops, I guess I should go back to my, uh, presentation mode here. Um, so we evolve for a time which is conditioned on the value of t in this time register. And uh, then I uh, do the quantum Fourier transform and I measure this uh, register, the time register in the computational basis. So in effect, I'm doing a frequency measurement. And um, as we discussed when we went through how phase estimation works. If I measure the m bit string, um, k m minus one, k m minus two, blah, blah, k one, k zero. So you can think of that as a particular integer uh, ranging from uh, zero to two to the m minus one. Uh, what we're doing is projecting out the component of this input wave function, which has an eigenvalue for the operator u, which is uh, the exponential of two pi i k over two to the m. Okay, and at least um, it may be that the energy eigenvalue, of course, um, doesn't terminate after m bits. But well, at least we'll get an estimate of that energy eigenvalue to this many uh, bits of accuracy. Well, I explained that when we went, went through phase estimation. So this is just an application of phase estimation, which remember allows us to estimate eigenvalues of a unitary operator. And we're using it to measure the operator e to the minus i h capital T, okay? And here I'm just reminding you that uh, for each one of the qubits in the time register, uh, the least significant, the next most significant, and so on. Uh, this procedure where we uh, conditionally evolve for uh, T repetitions of the unitary operator T, that's realized by uh, conditioning a single application of U on the least significant bet, bit, u squared on the next, u fourth on the next, and uh, so on, okay? And so what that's going to enable us to do is to measure the energy modulo two pi over t, because we're really measuring the eigenvalues of e to the minus uh, i h times capital T. But if we already know uh, something about the energy or can make a guess uh, that it's in the range, of from zero to two pi over capital T or uh, between um, two successive integer values of two pi over capital T, uh, then we can estimate E to M bits of accuracy. Okay. So uh, what we would do is there's this incoming state psi and uh, in effect, this is a projective measurement of the energy. So, if we repeated this procedure many times and uh, each time we get some value of k, if we made a histogram of the results, it would have peaks corresponding to each one of the eigenvalues of the energy. And so the positions of those eigenvalues would tell us our estimate of the energy. And the height of the peaks, that is how many times that particular value was found, that would be a measure of the inner product squared of the incoming state with that energy eigenstate with the observed energy eigenvalue, okay? So that's how we would use the quantum computer to measure the energy. And now uh, let's consider how costly this procedure is. Well, what we need to do is simulate time evolution. And we've already talked about the cost of doing that, okay? So that tells us uh, how to do the hard part of the circuit I just showed you, which is the conditional evolution by um, 
for time t. And uh, so we already know the answer for that. The largest evolution time that we're going to need to consider is a two to the m times t. We're going to be considering all possible evolution times from zero to two to the m minus one times capital T. And we let's say we want to get m bits of accuracy so that our measurement of uh, the frequency register at the end is really giving us an estimate of the energy to um, an accuracy, which is two to the minus m, where there are m qubits in the time register. Then we would like, um, or at least it'll be sufficient to have the error in the uh, longest time evolution that we considered uh, to be less than uh, two to the minus m. And so remember how the circuit size that we found for time evolution scales with the evolution time and the error, it went like h squared, which was our, h being our bound on each term in the local Hamiltonian, the um, space-time volume squared divided by the error. And in our case, we want to consider t, which is some fixed capital T times two to the m. Uh, so this t squared becomes capital T squared times two to the two m. And we want to have an error, which is two to the minus m. So we'll be sure we'll get our m bits of precision in the end. And so altogether, that's going to scale like n squared, the number of qubits times two to the three m. So we can say that the resources we need to estimate the energy scale polynomially in the system size, um, even if we're trying to attain an accuracy which um, goes like one over some power of the system size. So in other words, we want to get m bits of accuracy. So we want the accuracy of our estimate to go like two to the minus m. And let's say we want that accuracy to go like one over the number of qubits to some power, which I call c here. Um, well, how big a circuit uh, do we need? Well, this two to the three m here, that's the cube of two to the m. So that's n to the c cubed. And then we also have this factor of n squared from the way uh, we uh, simulated the time evolution. It wasn't the optimal way, but it's enough to prove the point that the circuit size that we needed to estimate the energy is polynomial in n in the number of qubits. I have the n squared coming from the volume. I have the n to the three c coming from getting good enough accuracy but it's bounded by some power of n. Okay, but there's still a catch. If we're going to estimate a particular energy eigenvalue, and by doing so, prepare the corresponding energy eigenstate, uh, we don't wanna to have to run this over and over again an exponential number of times. Let's say we're trying to find the ground state energy, which we often are. We wanna find the energy of the lowest state. Um, then if the inner product, if the overlap of the initial state psi on which we conducted the measurement with the ground state is exponentially small, then we would have to run this procedure an exponential of number of times before we'd ever find uh, that eigenvalue, okay? So if we wanna only have to run it a polynomial number of times, we're going to want the, that inner product to not be smaller than one over a polynomial of the system size. Now that doesn't sound too hard, but it's not necessarily easy because we have an exponentially large Hilbert space, dimension two to the N. If I just prepared some random state, its overlap with any fixed pure state would be exponentially small in M. It would go like two to the minus M. That wouldn't be good enough. That would mean I'd have to run our energy measurement exponential number of times to find any particular state I'm interested in, including the ground state. 
So I want to have a way of preparing an initial state which has a better overlap with the ground state than exponentially small. We want it to at least be no worse than one over polynomial in system size small. Okay. Well, there's a general procedure that we can try to give us an initial state which has a large enough overlap with the ground state. It doesn't always work, but sometimes it does. At least it's a general procedure we can try. And this procedure makes use of the quantum adiabatic theorem. And I won't go through the details. You may have learned about it in a course on quantum mechanics in the past, but let me just tell you what the assertion is that if a Hamiltonian changes very slowly as the state is evolving, then under conditions I'm about to tell you, if you start out with a good approximation to the ground state of the initial Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian slowly changes and you evolve according to the Schrodinger equation of that slowly changing Hamiltonian, then eventually you reach some final value of the Hamiltonian, what the adiabatic theorem says, is that the final state will be a good approximation to the ground state of the final Hamiltonian, okay? If we evolve slowly enough, and I have to tell you what it means to evolve slowly enough, if the Hamiltonian changes too quickly, then it won't necessarily work. So let me just repeat the picture again. Um, well, let me say how we're going to apply this. There's some Hamiltonian and we wanna measure its ground state energy, okay? Um, so we know how to measure energy. We just need to prepare a state which has uh, overlap with that ground state, which is not unreasonably small. We don't want it to be worse than one over polynomial. Ideally, we'd like it to be better than that, like a constant. Um, so here's what we do. We start out with some Hamiltonian, which is an easy one to find the ground state. It might be a Hamiltonian that doesn't have interactions among the qubits at all. Like all the, um, you know, it could just be a sum of poly operator Z for, um, for all of the uh, qubits. And then we know the lowest energy state would be that each one of the Z's is equal to minus one. Uh, the way a physicist would say that is you just put a bunch of spins in a magnetic field and to find the lowest energy state, they all want to line up with the magnetic field. So we start out with this easy Hamiltonian where we know what the ground state is and we can prepare the ground state in um, the quantum computer very easily. It just all spins up, um, all computational, you know, just a product of computational basis states. And then, we, can, we simulate using our Schrodinger evolution algorithm, the evolution of the state for a Hamiltonian that slowly changes. It starts out with this H easy, which is the Hamiltonian whose ground state was easy to construct. And that was the state that we started with. Then it slowly changes along some path and it winds up with the Hamiltonian we're really interested in. I called it H hard, meaning that its ground state energy is might be hard for us to compute. And now, according to the adiabatic theorem, if the change in the Hamiltonian along the path was slow enough, uh, then we'll wind up, if we started out with a good approximation to H easy, we'll wind up with a good approximation to H hard. So the simplest thing would be just like a linear interpolation between the two, where at time zero, the Hamiltonian is H easy. And then we'll let the time slow increase from zero to capital T. And as it does so, H easy turns off linearly in, team, in time while H hard is turning on. And finally, when we reach little t equals capital T, H easy is gone and the Hamiltonian is H hard. It doesn't necessarily have to be this linear interpolation. The adiabatic theorem will be happy for any path from the initial Hamiltonian to the final Hamiltonian. 
accept. Now I have to say what it means for the evolution um, to be slow enough, for the Hamiltonian to change slowly enough. As the Hamiltonian is changing at every point along the path, there's some ground state and there's a first excited state, the uh, state with the second lowest energy eigenstate. And the difference between those two energies, the ground state energy and the first excited state, that's called the energy gap. It just means the spacing between the two lowest eigenvalues. And as um, we evolve the Hamiltonian, as the Hamiltonian changes along the path from H easy to H hard, uh, that gap is going to change because both the ground state energy and the first excited state have energies that change in time. There's some closest approach between the two eigenvalues, which is called the minimum gap. I'm gonna call that capital delta. So here it's defined the way I just said, um, as the uh, time little t evolves, or as we evolve along the path from H easy to H hard, parameterized by little t, varying from zero to capital T, the minimum value that's attained by the difference between the ground state energy and the uh, first excited state, that's what I'm calling delta, the minimal gap. What the adiabatic theorem says is that if I choose T large enough, capital T controls how slowly with increasing little t, the Hamiltonian is changing. If I choose it large enough, large enough means greater than some constant divided by a power of the minimum gap, then we'll stay in a good approximation to the ground state if we started out in one. And um, why is it true? Well, I'm not gonna prove it for you or anything. It can be proved. Um, the intuition is that if there's a gap between the ground state and the excited state and the system is slowly changing, to you have to excite the system from the ground state to the first excited state by giving it a, a wrap, by introducing some energy. The energy is coming from whatever um, mechanism, whatever agent is causing the Hamiltonian to change in time. And in order to jump in energy, we need to push the system at a characteristic frequency, which is a good match between the difference in energy between the uh, initial state and the final state. And when the Hamiltonian is changing very slowly, uh, there's very little support in its uh, Fourier transform at frequencies that, um, that match the minimum gap. And so there's very little amplitude for exciting the system from the ground state to the first excited state or to any of the higher states as well. And um, so it just stays stuck in the ground state. Okay. So um, that means that our procedure for preparing the ground state will work well enough if the energy gap, the minimum energy gap, never gets smaller during this excursion of the Hamiltonian from the easy Hamiltonian to the hard Hamiltonian, then one over some polynomial in the system size. If it's one over the polynomial in the system size, then we have to evolve for a time which is uh, has a sufficiently large uh, value of capital T, but that's going to be polynomial in the system size. And we know we can evolve for a time which is polynomial in system size at a cost which is polynomial in system size. Because that's what I showed you in our uh, discussion of um, simulating time evolution governed by the Schrodinger equation. So one over polynomial in N gap is okay. At least it means that in a polynomial time on a quantum computer, we'll be able to prepare the ground state. But if it gets worse than that, if it gets super polynomially small at some point during the excursion, uh, then 
then it's going to fail because then we would have to evolve for a super polynomial time. If the gap gets exponentially small in n at some point, then to avoid jumping across the gap to stay in the ground state with reasonable amplitude, uh, we would have to evolve for an exponentially long time. And that has an exponentially high cost in terms of circuit size. Okay. And in fact, we think this is exactly what goes wrong in some cases, that there are some Hamiltonians for which it's hard, even with a quantum computer, to estimate the ground state energy to an accuracy that goes like one over polynomial in n. I'm gonna explain in the next lecture why we think it's true. Well, I can tell you now, what we're going to discuss in the next lecture is that the problem in general of estimating ground state energy to one over poly n accuracy is a QMA hard problem. If we could really do it efficiently, we'd be able to solve efficiently every problem in QMA, the quantum analog of NP. And almost everybody agrees that's very unlikely. So that means there must be at least some local Hamiltonians for which um, quantum computers can't solve uh, for the ground state energy, can't find the ground state energy in polynomial time. And since we know how to do the evolution, we know how to do the phase estimation, what, what must go wrong is that the um, state preparation fails. That it's just too hard to prepare an initial state that has an overlap with the ground state which is um, no worse than one over a polynomial. In some cases, uh, that's just got to be hard. Now, that's a little discouraging. It means there are some local Hamiltonians for which preparing the ground state is hard even with a quantum computer. But what does it tell us about the conjecture or the uh, expectation I was advocating just a minute ago that we should, with a quantum computer, be able to efficiently simulate any process that occurs in nature if we can't even, with a quantum computer, construct the good approximation to the ground state of some local Hamiltonian. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, we fail in our goal of uh, simulating physics. The lesson you can draw is that if there's a Hamiltonian such that finding the ground state or preparing the ground state is a QMA hard problem, then the preparation of the ground state isn't going to occur in nature. There won't be any natural process that will be able to prepare that state. So if we're interested with our quantum computer in simulating things that can really happen in the physical world, then reaching the ground state of one of these QMA, QMA hard local Hamiltonians uh, isn't a problem we need to solve because that's not something that occurs in nature. Um, now, you know, what states can be prepared in nature is ultimately a question about cosmology and the early universe. And so that gets us into um, a lot of interesting issues. But, um, you know, the uh, high level observation is that there are things that we can't do in polynomial time on a quantum computer, we meeting the quantum computer operators, the quantum engineers, then uh, nature can't do it either. And so that doesn't mean that we're not able to efficiently simulate nature. Uh, okay, so I guess that will do it for today. Just one more lecture to go. And the next time I will talk more about this idea that um, finding the ground state of a local Hamiltonian, estimating its energy to one over polynomial and an accuracy is a really hard problem in general, a QMA hard problem. So until then, uh, thanks for stopping by. It's, um, it's been fun as always. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next time. In the meanwhile, uh, take care of yourself and be well. I'll see you soon.